This has been a rich Sunday, just a delight. We heard a whole host of wonderful messages this morning in the waters of baptism. We get this evening to continue our study of the Bible, 66 books, and we are in the book of Ruth this evening. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth and follow along as I read our text this evening. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that I may give you husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, I should even have a husband tonight and bear sons. Would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of Yahweh has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may Yahweh do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since Yahweh has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May Yahweh be with you. And they said to him, May Yahweh bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came, and she has remained from morning until now, and she has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. 
Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May Yahweh reward your work and your wages be full from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today, and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of Yahweh, who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, furthermore, he said to me, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her daughter, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz our kinsman, with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, it is true I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you. As Yahweh lives, lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. So she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the closest relative, 
Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm a matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from the brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the seed which Yahweh will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And Yahweh enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, to Hezron Ram, to Ram Aminadab, and to Aminadab was born Nashan, and to Nashan Salmon, and to Salmon Boaz, and to Boaz Obed. To Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse David. The book of Ruth. Now I know Jake last week did not read the entire book of Judges before he started. But Jake set us up very well to think about this wonderful story. The book of Ruth is a romance. It's a love story. It's a story that begins with things going badly and then things turning out for good in the end. It is a story all by itself. It is well written. It really is a a beautiful literary work. But this story is not by itself. It sits in our Bibles. There are characters in this book. We have met Naomi and Ruth, and Boaz, and a few others. Naomi was a woman of Israel who had lost her husband and her two sons. She was in a land with no social security. She was not only tragically alone, but also left without any means of financial support or personal protection. She was destitute, in desperate circumstances, in dire straits. Ruth was a woman of Moab, married to one of Naomi's sons. She too was left a widow, And she attached herself to Naomi, to Naomi's people, and to Naomi's God. And we met Boaz, a man of Israel, a kinsman to Naomi, a redeemer of the family and the land. But the main character in this story, of course, is the Lord, the God of Israel, the one true God over all the earth. We see his remarkable providence in this book. That is God's sovereign orchestration of events. Naomi happened to return to Israel during barley harvest. They happened to meet a friend, a close relative of her husband. In chapter 2, verse 3, Ruth happened, literally chanced upon Boaz's field. What's striking about the book of Ruth is God is obviously orchestrating the entire narration. And there are no miracles. Nobody is raised from the dead. No healings are done. 
This is a story of ordinary people under the sovereign guidance of a good God maintaining his purposes and keeping his promises. And what is the book of Ruth doing in our Bibles? We could, have, of course, look to Romans 15, 4. The things written in earlier times were written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement in Ruth, we might have hope. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. We, we can look to Ruth for examples. There are bad examples. There are good examples. There is, of course, the Lord's example in here. Ruth is in our Bibles, in our English Bibles, right between the book of Judges and the books of Samuel. And the book of Ruth serves as something like a seam between these other two books, progressing the narration of God's grand story of redemption. Look at the end of Judges, the last verse of the book of Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Verse 1 of Ruth 1, it came about in the days when the judges governed. Do you see the seam? It's like the stitches in a baseball that hold the panels together. Look at the last word of the book of Ruth. Do you see it there? David. What is the next book? Samuel. The book of Samuel is about the establishment of the monarchy and God's establishment of the Davidic covenant up until 2 Samuel 7. This is all leading towards the Davidic line and the continuation of God's promises through that line. And it's interesting that Samuel does not begin with a genealogy. Where does the genealogy as the seam show up? At the end of the book of Ruth. This book of Ruth holds our Bibles together in the unfolding storyline of God's getting glory for himself as king through judgment and through salvation. Again, that's the theme of the whole Bible. God will be glorified as king overall through judgment and salvation. And this book works as a seam between those parts. There's something important bibliological just thinking about that. There is one author to this whole book, the Bible. And the various books of the Bible have various names and titles attached to them. There, there are a number of human authors who have written and composed God's Word, superintended, carried along by the Holy Spirit, so that they compose without error God's very words. But ultimately, there is one author, one capital A author over the whole, who has written the entire story and assured that all of those human authors are all in line with him writing his story. I want to give you this evening a thematic outline for the book. We just read the entire story in its whole. You've, you've gotten the story from beginning to end. I, I want to arrange our thoughts about this book in four points revolving around four themes we see in this book. What is the book of Ruth about? Well, number one, it is about God's patience with faithlessness in Israel. The book of Ruth is about God's patience with faithlessness in Israel. Back to Ruth 1 1. It came about in the days of the judges. This was the downward spiral of depravity, delinquency, and debauchery that Jacob took us through last week. And notice in verse 1 there was a famine in the land. This famine in the land is an evidence of God's faithfulness to his promises. On the negative side, this is a covenant curse. Look back at Deuteronomy 28 for a moment. There in Deuteronomy, God had made promises of blessing for obedience and promises of cursing for disobedience. Listen to these curses, Deuteronomy 28, 15. It shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today. All these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Verse 17, cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Verse 23, the heaven which is over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron. Yahweh will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. 
in an agrarian society dependent on rain, a bronze ceiling and an iron floor and dust coming down from the sky are pictures of drought and famine. You can't grow, you can't eat. Look at verse 38. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little. The locust will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor of the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You will have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for the olives will drop off. This is what God had promised. A famine in the land in the time of the judges is actually God keeping his promises. He will be king. He will be king in judgment. And then we're introduced to this man named Elimelech, verse 2. Elimelech's name means, God is my king. That's interesting in this scene. There, There was no king in Israel. Elimelech's name, God is my king. But how does Elimelech live. He, he sojourns. He sojourns in the land. We, we've heard this word before in the biblical narrative, sojourning. You're, you're wandering around, trekking, looking forward to rest in the land of promise. What is Elimelech doing? He's sojourning out of the land of promise, away from rest promised by Yahweh. This is an act of faithlessness on Elimelech's part. His name means God is my king, and yet he has gone elsewhere to look for provision, for sustenance. This is a decision of expedience. He's going to leave the land of promise? And look, there's not a mass exodus here. Uh, The the text seems to indicate that he leaves alone. He, He just makes an independent decision. I'm not going to stay here in the land and trust Yahweh. He's not going to pray. He's not going to do what Psalm 37, 4 says, stay in the land, excuse me, Psalm 37, 3, stay in the land and cultivate faithfulness. He's going to strike out on his own. And this sounds like a good decision. What is a man supposed to do? I got to provide for my family we got to have food. There's a famine. Where is food? It's over there in Moab. This sounds like a, a manly decision. And this is a faithless decision. This is a doing what is right in his own eyes. And he intended to sojourn. What, what do we find out in this text? He was there 10 years. Or perhaps... The family was there 10 years after his sons took Moabite women. There's a little ambiguity there. Maybe they they were in the land 10 years. Maybe maybe they were in the land 20 years. Regardless, Elimelech was buried there. What about the land of promise? What what about the lineage? What, What about the allotment? And his sons were buried in Moab. Listen, Elimelech had a name of fidelity to Yahweh, but a life of infidelity. Uh, We we might say it this way today, uh, someone is Christian in name only. That was Elimelech. And notice verse 4, here's more faithlessness in Israel. The sons took for themselves Moabite women. Uh, There was a command in Deuteronomy 7 not to intermarry, and, and a number of nations are listed that the people are not to intermarry with. Moab's not in that list, but that list is not a total list either. It doesn't include all of the nations in the land of Canaan that they were not to intermarry with. But a reason is given in Deuteronomy 7 that is a critical principle that was violated. And the principle was this, you will be tempted to go after their gods. So don't give your sons in marriage to their daughters. What is the principle there? Your heartstrings will be tugged by a relationship and your life commitments will follow your heartstrings. Disney says follow your heart. Your heart runs to disaster. Your life follows suit. The reality is you live according to what you set your heart on. Solomon himself was indicted on this very issue. In 1 Kings 11, we read that uh, Moab is named specifically amongst the women that Solomon took as wives for himself. And you find out in that very chapter that Solomon built an altar to Chemosh, the god of Moab, a, a demon god of the Moabite people that demanded child sacrifice. This was a dangerous proposition. 
And verse 4 says that these sons took wives for themselves. The, the Hebrew word for taking here, uh, when connected with marriage, always has a negative connotation. This isn't a matter of trusting the Lord and finding a bride. No, they took for themselves that which was unauthorized. What is the result in the land of Moab for them? Death and barrenness. Notice the, the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. They are childless. Perhaps married for 10 years with no kids. You know, this is judgment. This path of expediency has led to a loss of blessing. Elimelech did what was right in his own eyes. His sons did what was right in their own eyes. But there's another theme in this book you need to see. And it is that God's faithfulness to keep a faithful remnant in Israel. God is faithful to keep a faithful remnant in Israel. He is patient with faithless Israel because Israel still exists. But he is also faithful to keep a remnant. So the book of Ruth takes place during the time of Judges, but, but the book of Ruth is not included in the book of Judges. Did you notice that? The, the, the four-chapter story of Ruth is not in the, the book that Jake taught last week. It, it's not just one of the other stories there. It, it's, in God's design, separated out. There is an intentional contrast. It's a different book. Onlookers in the time of the Judges might have looked at Israel and wondered if Yahweh would utterly reject His people because of their utter faithlessness to Him. And it's interesting in verse 3 of chapter 1, she was left with her two sons. That word left there is the same word used throughout the Bible of Israel when God wants to describe a remnant. In other words, Naomi remained. She was a faithful remnant of, of Israel. God is keeping a faithful remnant here and Naomi is evidence of that. She was left as the faithful remnant out of her faithless family. And Naomi was a woman of faith. Notice the name of Yahweh is on her lips in verse 9. May Yahweh grant that you may find rest. She's speaking out about rest, a, a very biblical concept, and she is invoking the name of Yahweh. She's not calling on Chemosh. She's actually asking that Yahweh, the God of Israel, will provide for her daughters-in-law. The law of Yahweh is on her mind. In addition to having Yahweh's name on her lips, she's got Yahweh's law on her mind. Look at verse 10. They said to her, no, we'll return with you to your people. Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Go. Even if I could have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait to marry them? What is Ruth talking about here? This is the strangest dating scheme I've ever heard of. Right? 21st century ears just go, that is bizarre. No, she is actually appealing to God's law, to the principle of, of what the Old Testament called leveret marriage. And the idea here, and this comes out of um, Deuteronomy 25, is that if a man died and left no children and his wife became a widow, the man's name and his lineage was tied to the promise of God's allotment of land in the promised land of Israel. And if no one carried on the name, the name died out and the allotment was left without a lineage. And you understand the, the Bible so far as we've been walking through this. We've seen the seed promise and the land promise pervasive in the Old Testament story. That continues here and it is what is in Naomi's heart and so she's not actually proposing that she find a husband and, and they marry the younger stepchildren. She is appealing to the reality that God has provided for a way for widows to be cared for, lineage to be maintained, and the land to maintain its promised allotment under God's care. That, that's his law for the land of Israel. That's what's in her heart. That's what's in her mind as she's encouraging her daughters-in-law, Moabite women. So go back to the land of Moab. Find husbands there. I, I can't fulfill this leveret promise for you. 
It would be unreasonable for you to wait. It's interesting that when Naomi comes back to the land of Israel, we find the mercy of God. It's late April when she returns. It's the time of barley harvest. And the land of Israel is governed or is supposed to be governed by the gleaning laws. Leviticus 19 says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners. Don't glean all of the harvest. Don't glean your vineyard. Uh, Neither shall you gather the fallen fruit. You shall leave all of that for the needy and for the stranger. I am Yahweh your God. Here we see God's kindness in providing for his people. This is widow care. This is God's version of caring for the destitute. That farmers wouldn't get all the crops out of their field, but intentionally leave some to care for those in need. And when Naomi comes back, we see her faith. And we see her faith mixed with bitterness. Naomi's name means sweet and delightful. When she comes back to the land, verse 20, she said, Don't call me sweet and delightful. Call me bitter. Call me Mara. Why? Because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Think about these words. You can understand Naomi here, can't you? Having left the land, been away for so long, been in a foreign land, having lost her husband, lost her sons, and and by losing her husband and losing her sons, she has lost a toehold on God's promises for her and for her line and for her family and for her land. We'll find out later in the book. She's going to have to sell the land. She cannot provide for herself. She cannot protect herself. This is a desperate state. You could probably resonate with with her feelings here. She says, I went out full, but I came back empty. And and even though we we can put ourselves in her shoes and, and we can understand, we must also recognize that her faith is mixed here with ingratitude and bitterness. She she names herself bitterness. She knows this. She knows there is resentment against the Almighty mixed in her heart here. Listen, she says, I went out full. Went out full? What are you talking about? It was a famine. You didn't go out full. You went to Moab looking for food. And and, and you've come back and God has provided at harvest time. And she said, I came back empty. Poor Ruth. (laughs) Is Ruth standing there? I, I came back with nothing. And this... Sweet daughter-in-law who's better to her than seven sons is at her side. God has provided richly for her. And isn't this what our hearts do sometimes? We focus our attention on what God has not given that we think he should. That we miss all the things that God has graciously provided that we do not deserve. That's all in the mix here. You don't get from Naomi a Genesis 50, 20 statement, do you? My husband meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You don't get a Romans 8, 28. God is causing all these things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. No, she says, call me bitter. Her gratitude is obscured by complaint. And God is kind to her in her complaint. Look, our faith is always imperfect, and God is so patient with us, isn't he? She clearly adhered to Yahweh and to his promises and to prescriptions of Yahweh's laws through Moses. There's another background text which Naomi clearly understood and desired to adhere to. It is in Leviticus 25, and it is the principle of land redemption by a kinsman. This is evident in chapter 2, verse 20 to 23. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May that one be blessed of Yahweh who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. She said, The man is our relative, our closest relative, our, in Hebrew, goel, a, a kinsman redeemer. In other words, this man who has provided for you meets the qualifications of what God promised should happen, what God prescribed for his people, a close relative who can redeem 
Listen again, she, she knows God's word. It's in her heart. She recognizes a close kin who's eligible and even responsible to reclaim lost land. God has maintained faith in Israel. And then we meet Boaz. Boaz is a man with fidelity to Yahweh. We're introduced to him in chapter 2. He greets his laborers in the morning in verse 4. Look at this. Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May Yahweh be with you. And they said, May Yahweh bless you. The fact that it's this sort of antiphonal rehearsed statement sounds like the daily morning greeting. What does this man do when he goes out to his labor force at his work site? May Yahweh bless you. Okay, he's not the, the, the man driving the tasks, forcing his laborers, and then after they've done the work, he says, look what I've accomplished. No, he sends the workers out with Yahweh's blessing, invoking the Lord's blessing on all their work. And then they rehearse back to him. It's as if they do this every day. And then he displays countercultural kindness. Look down at verse 9. He says to the woman, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. I've commanded them not to touch you. He, he's taking initiative. He's thinking ahead. He's planning. He's compassionate. And then look at this. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. The slaves don't get to do that. The, the, the servants would be the ones who would draw water. And in that culture, it was the women who would draw for men. Here, the servants have drawn, placed them in the, the stone water jars. And Boaz invites her to drink from that. He is making all of this provision easy for her because he is generous. And, and all of this he does for someone who is lower than a servant, an outsider, and a destitute woman. Notice the effect of his grace in verse 10. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground. Why have I found favor in your sight? Isn't this what she went to do? I want to find favor in the sight of somebody. And then when Boaz was so kind and so generous, she fell on her face, amazed and astounded and humbled. And isn't the effect of God's grace in our lives that way? You just, you don't deserve it and you feel small, so grateful. Not entitled. And then he invokes Yahweh. The name of Yahweh is on his lips. Verse 12. May Yahweh reward your work. May your wages be full from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose refuge you have come to seek shelter. We find out he is a kinsman redeemer down in verse 20. The kinsman that we mentioned here, this closest relative is the one who is eligible to redeem land within the clan. And land could be lost to indebtedness. Uh, land could be lost because there was no male to inherit it. And a kinsman redeemer was qualified under Mosaic law to redeem the land. A kinsman redeemer was qualified to buy back a family member sold into slavery, Leviticus 25. He was qualified to redeem family lineage through marriage, Deuteronomy 25. He could avenge the murder of a close family member, Numbers 35. He could receive restitution money for a deceased family member, Numbers 5. And he could seek justice in a lawsuit on behalf of a family member. And in this miserable period of faithlessness in Israel, God has maintained a faithful remnant. And Boaz is an example. And you see in the interchange of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, this relationship progressing and God's maintaining a faithful remnant. Boaz expresses interest and yet he is honorable in it. He seeks to provide for Ruth and for Naomi, but he is not seeking his own benefit first of all. He expresses reserve and self-control even while taking initiative in this relationship. He recognizes that Ruth is not for the taking, nor is the land for his taking. He actually seeks to uphold God's intentions for inheritance, for keeping the family line going, for maintaining the allotment of the land according to God's promise. And he does all of that in an honorable way. Likewise, Naomi's plan, it's in verses 3 to 5 of chapter 3, would be a humble approach designed to preserve Boaz's honor. And I know this sounds strange to us. Look at verse 3. She says to Ruth, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, go down to the threshing floor, don't make yourself known until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, when no one can see when it's dark, go uncover his feet. Then he will tell you what to do. 
By the way, this is not a dating scheme. She is following the instructions of her mother-in-law who has hope in Yahweh based on Yahweh's promises and specific instructions about a kinsman redeemer. There is actually a responsibility in the land to carry on the family lineage. Ruth's own husband who is dead, his name is attached to land and his name and his line must be continued. Naomi knows this. Ruth trusts this. And this approach is designed to do so in the dark, in secret, so as to preserve Boaz's honor should he not fulfill the leveret marriage opportunity. So the plan is at night, go uncover his feet. What happens if your feet are uncovered? It gets cold at night. You wake up. What? Why, are, why are my feet cold? You would bend down to recover your feet. And oh, there's a shadow there. What? Who are you? That's the plan. Not some strange or, or sensual thing. Look at verse 12. Boaz wakes up and, and sees Ruth and, and says to her in verse 11, uh, I know you're a woman of excellence. Verse 12, he says, it is true that I am a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I. What does verse 12 indicate to us? Boaz was already thinking about Ruth. He was already thinking about marriage. He, he had it on his mind, but what, Bo, what could Boaz not do? Usurp the right of another to the land or to the woman. He is honorable in this. Notice what he says next. This is astounding. Remain this night when morning comes. If that man, that closer relative will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will as Yahweh lives. He invokes Yahweh's honor for keeping his word that he will see fit or that he will see to it that Ruth and Naomi are provided for in their destitution. He will be the kinsman redeemer or somebody will. Do you see the selflessness in Boaz? A faith in God's word that results in trust in God's instructions about how to do it so that Boaz is keeping to the letter. Trusting God with the outcome. Honoring Ruth and Naomi in the process. And his generosity continues even if Boaz did not get the privilege of marrying Ruth, which he desired, he was going to see that Ruth was provided for, that her husband's line was continued. That's fascinating to me. He's not looking to make a name for himself. He's willing to marry her to carry on her dead husband's line for the land allotment promise that belonged to him according to God's rules. This is faith in Israel. Trusting submission to God's word. A little contrast, I can't help this. Uh, in chapter 4, you get the alternative potential kinsman redeemer who doesn't take the opportunity. Well, he does when he finds out there's land. And land would mean more room for crops, more income. When he finds out that the land is attached to another man's name who would be the inheritor, he backs out. When he finds out he's got to take Ruth the Moabitess so that he can extend her dead husband's allotment. He's like, nope, I don't need to provide for widows that way. Maybe there's some stigma with the fact that she's a Moabitess. Maybe there's a cost to the fact that now you've got two widows to care for, not just land for income. And what was his stated reason? Oh, I can't do it. It would jeopardize my inheritance. What's he saying? My name. My name wouldn't be on the title deed of the land. This would be a threat to, to my lineage and my name and my honor. Guess what we never get in this book? His name. <laughs> we don't know who he is, and he never shows up again in the Bible. But Boaz, we know. Boaz cared about God's honor, God's promise, and two desperate widows. The other man cared about himself. A third theme here, God grants mercy we see God's mercy to grant faith to an enemy of Israel. This is a kindness to Gentiles right here in the Old Testament. Ruth the Moabitess, the word Moabitess shows up again and again and again. We are reminded over and over again that Moab was that land across the Jordan River, across the Dead Sea from Israel to the east. 
She is Ruth the Jordanian. She is on the other side. Where did the land of Moab, the people of Moab, come from? This was the result of Lot's drunken incest with his daughters, Genesis 19. You remember that Israel was not helped by Moab in their trek to the promised land. They hired Balaam to curse Israel, Numbers 22 to 24. Then they seduced Israelites with immorality and idolatry in Numbers 25. They worshipped Chemosh, the demon of Moabite religion who demands child sacrifice. And you remember that Eglon, the king of Moab, oppressed Israel for 18 years during the time of the judges. The words of Ephesians 2 come to mind. But God, who is rich in mercy. When you think about Israel's mission in the Old Testament, they were to live different. They were to be a peculiar people so that a watching world would look in on Israel. They eat different. They dress different. Everything they do is weird. Why? Because they belong to the one true God. They are his people, and he is their God. Hey, let's find out about Yahweh. Look how he blesses them. Look at the word uh, from his mouth that he's given. It's not like anything anybody else has. Remember how he rescued them out of Egyptian slavery? They were to be famous in the world because they served the one true God. Israel failed at her mission. Did the nations know about Yahweh because Israel was conformed to his character? Not at all. What, what would the world look at Israel How would the world look at Israel during the time of the judges? (laughs) Wait, who do they serve? Who's their God? What are their laws? Just a disaster. And here we have God's mercy to Ruth. Through Elimelech's faithlessness, a Moabite woman believes and clings to Yahweh. And notice Ruth's faith. Back in chapter 1. Verse 15, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went back home. We never hear about Orpah again in the Bible. But Ruth, Ruth's story is very different. In verses 16 and 17, she invokes God's people, God's name, the name of Yahweh. She, in verse 11 of chapter 2, has an excellent reputation All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported me. How you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth. That sounds like Abram out of the land of the Chaldees. And you came to a people that you did not previously know. Why would Ruth leave her own parents, leave her own land, leave her own ways, her own culture, her own gods, and come to Israel? She had heard of Yahweh ostensibly through Naomi. There was a fledgling faith here in Ruth. She calls on Yahweh's name. She wants to be part of Yahweh's people. She's following the laws of Yahweh. This is not a story about how to find a man. There were other eligible bachelors in Israel. Boaz acknowledged it, but Ruth followed God's instructions. Naomi lays out the leveret marriage laws, and Ruth follows her directions. She could have gone after younger men, wealthier men. And she followed the instructions. She is called in 311, a woman of excellence. Interesting word, same word that shows up in Proverbs 31 about the excellent woman. And in your Hebrew Bible, your Hebrew Bible, I don't know if you have a Hebrew Bible. But in the Hebrew Bible, guess where the book of Ruth shows up? Right after Proverbs 31 and right before Song of Solomon. The excellent woman and marriage. Ruth's right in the middle. A fourth theme, final theme this evening. We see God's faithfulness to keep his promise to the world. God's faithfulness to keep his promise to the world. What do I mean by that? Uh, God made a promise to the snake in Genesis 3.15 that the woman will bear a seed who will crush the head of the serpent. The end of the curse, forgiveness of sin, the destruction of Satan, all promised in Genesis 3.15. We've been looking for the seed of the woman This book has a woman and seed. The the storyline is continuing. And and some words just jump out of the page at us who have the rest of Scripture at our disposal. Right? Chapter 1, verse 2, the man was Elimelech. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Does that sound familiar? Who are you? Bethlehem of Judea? Ephrathah? Too small to be significant? 
Right out of the Old Testament prophets, right out of New Testament fulfillment, all those words jumbled up here. That stands out to us. We have in verse 17, a a son born to Naomi in chapter 4, verse 17. That's interesting. She's grandma. (laughs) But, But this son born to the woman who is bereft and destitute. You think about an entire nation who who is destitute and bereft of faithfulness to God and and the line is being cut off and instead a son is born and the line is preserved. And then listen to these words in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 4. All the people in the court, all the elders said, were witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah, become famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the seed which Yahweh will give you by the woman. Do you see all these words here? The house of Israel. The seed, the woman, Judah, Bethlehem. These words jump off the page to us as we see the unfolding of God's plan. Listen, in verse 18, we get this statement. These are the generations. And if you remember back to Ashley Anderson's message from the book of Genesis, the the Toledotes or, or the generations were those literary markers of division in the book of Genesis that actually showed the progress and the advancement of God's redemptive plan Here we get another Toledot, a a generation statement. And and what do we see here? Look at verse 18. Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashan, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. A genealogy, a Toledot. This is advancing the line, advancing the progress. And and if you are an Old Testament reader and you're reading the book of Ruth and you see woman and seed and a genealogy and the word Toledot, God's still working. God's keeping his promises. He, He hasn't forgotten us sinners in the world under the curse after the fall. When you get to the line of Messiah in Matthew chapter 1, four women are there. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. They kind of all show up right here in one way or another. Think about this first one, Tamar. It's interesting that the... The genealogy doesn't start with Judah. It starts with the son of Judah, Perez. But how did Perez become the son of Judah? By the worst example of leveret marriage in the Bible. Judah would not give the other brothers to the bereft widow to extend the line. What does the widow do? She in one sense, demands that the line of her husband continue through family lineage, through incest, prostitution. It's an awful story. And that's the first name on the page of this genealogy right here. Perez. It's ugly. Shocking. And of course you get Tamar in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. You get Rahab, the the harlot, um, another foreigner who believed. And then you get Ruth, the Moabitess, Moabitess, Moabitess foreigner who believed. And then you have Bathsheba named, who was the wife of Uriah, whom David had killed. Naomi's name here is Mara. And to her is given a son. It's just interesting language. The seed of promise leading to the godly king over Israel. From the son of Naomi comes David the godly king. There's another Mara in the Bible. There is Mary. Who has a greater son, the greater king, the seed of the woman. Also born at a time of great apostasy in Israel, where there was a small remnant of faith in God's outpouring of mercy to outsider nations, the Gentiles, graciously granting faith to all of us by the seed of the woman. 
truly is a remarkable story. It, it is a love story. Uh, there is human love and human marriage here. It, it is, of course, the story of God's love for sinners in preserving the line and keeping his promises. It's also a wonderful biblical counseling resource. To go back through and, and think through the details here, we learn about dealing with difficult circumstances. There are consequences to our sin, and, and we live with the consequences of other people's sin. What's the solution to all of that? Whether you've sinned, and you go, okay, now what? Or someone else has sinned, and you're suffering, okay, now what? Hope. There's hope. Turn to the Lord. Trust the Lord. There's a lesson here in trusting the Lord over expediency. Elimelech found food for his family, but at what cost? He made what the world might consider to be a reasonable or even responsible decision, but he did so out of his discontent and his distrust. Perhaps he was squeezed into the mold of the era of the judges. He did what was right in his own eyes. Listen, there's something worse than starving. It is infidelity to God. We learn something here about obedient faith, even in the midst of a faithless generation. If nobody else around you is following Yahweh, you be faithful. You walk out to your workplace and you say, may Yahweh give you success today. And you teach your employees to say, may Yahweh find favor. You just live different. That's okay. We learn something here about God's ultimate purposes that will not be thwarted by human faithlessness. Sure, there are human examples to follow, but bigger than that, there are promises of God to believe and a Messiah to anticipate. Boaz's labor as a kinsman redeemer is, of course, a foreshadowing of a kinsman redeemer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was made like us. And he came to purchase with his own blood that which we could not redeem, our lost selves. He came to preserve God's promises, to fulfill God's purposes, and to redeem sinners through faith for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that you have constructed your self-disclosure to us, that we might know you and know your ways. We pray that you would increase our appetite for your word. May we live by it as with the daily bread of the soul. And we pray as we go out from this place that we would trust in you. Oh Lord, would you help our unbelief? And would we be faithful testimonies of your grace all this week in the various places you put us? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.